Hello, my name is Kay Tempest Bradford, and I'd like to welcome you to the Writing the Other Roundtable, How to Stay in Your Lane, Writing Characters of Color When You Are White. I am joined by two fabulous authors who have spoken at length about this subject before, and I wanted to have a conversation with them about it, given that Writing the Other is about to do a lot of master classes, and there are going to be a lot more students who are interested in figuring out like how to sort of bridge this divide, get this balance together. So I am joined today by Jamie Goh and Justine Ireland, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Jamie? Hi, my name is Jamie Goh. I am a Malaysian Chinese international student currently at UC, um, University of California, Riverside, where I pursue a PhD in comparative literature where I write a dissertation on whiteness in steampunk. Um, I'm also an editor of The Sea is Ours, Tales of Steampunk Southeast Asia, and uh, I also write assorted short fiction and poetry here and there. That's me. Justina? Hi, my name is Justina Ireland. I am a young adult author of two books currently published, both by Simon & Schuster, Books for Young Readers, Vengeance Bound, and um, my other book is Promise of Shadows. Um, I speak out a lot on Twitter about um, depictions of people of color within the Y Kidlet community and also SFF community. Um, I'm a CIFWA director at large. Um, I also am an MFA student, and my current thesis is actually on the idea that um, depictions of um, marginalized folks within Kidlet tend to be not good. Um, the idea that, you know, we have a few token positions um, where we can occupy and everything else is kind of just like for the white folks. Um, I, my writing has appeared in Story Magazine, um, also Fire, Fireside Magazine just recently with the um, SFF roll-up of the um, black authors in science fiction, and i um, just excited to be here. Thank you both for joining me, actually. This is uh, really great. I've been wanting to talk to you both about this for a very long time. And that is because uh, this sort of idea generated, it started because you both uh, had these two separate Twitter threads that were both basically talking about the same thing, where you were talking about writers who were writing POC protagonists and, and why you would either give that the side eye or or you just you know were identifying problems that arose from it. And so I'd just like to start by asking you, um, what triggered those tweets, if you remember? Let's start with Justine. Justine. Thank you. <laughs> um, so actually, I do remember. So the most famous recent um, string of tweets was from uh, Voya Magazine had uh, a diversity issue, which is a great uh, voice. Voya Magazine's voice the uh, the youth advocates. It's a magazine geared at librarians, especially teen librarians, uh, teen services librarians, and they had a diversity at, um, issue. And it was an amazing issue. They had um, articles from Debbie Reese, they had articles from um, Edie Campbell, you know, a real great gamut of articles. And then they also had this article by Patrick Jones, who is a white guy from um, Minnesota who basically said, hey look, I work with kids who are, you know, kids of color, I got it. I can figure out how to write those kids. Um, and it was just, it was, he was coming from a good place, and the intent was good, but the impact was just so, 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 so bad. Um, and actually, there's a line in there where he talks about writing a story, and he had a line about Tanisha's blunt, and uh, he was like, "I had to tear and take it out because it, you know, it was too offensive, and you know, white guys aren't supposed to talk about black people doing drugs." It was, it was, it was kind of a mess, and it kind of brought home this idea that just because you think you know a population doesn't mean you actually know a population. Um, work, we get, we see a lot of that, especially in kid lit, where. Folks are like, you know, I know we need diverse books, so I'm going to go ahead and go out and write it. And they're kind of missing that message is we don't necessarily need you to write that if you don't know how to write it well. Um, there's, there's so few depictions of people of color, especially as protagonists, that when you have one of these just terrible depictions, it just kind of becomes the norm. It becomes the mainstream. Um, and that was kind of what started my string of tweets is just seeing this, you know, this magazine that had done this diversity issue where basically a white guy kind of came up and said, hey, look, 
I'm going to give it my best shot, and if I phone it in, then you really don't get to judge me, because at least I tried, um, which is <laughs> that old uh, the gif of uh, um, the dude from Harry Potter. is like, I, I, at least I tried. It's like, no, no, trying is not necessarily, you know, you don't get a pass for trying. So, so that's what started my tweets. Yeah, that, I remember that, and yes, just trying is not. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Uh, how about you, Jamie? I know that you, um, the tweets that I was thinking of were ones where you were talking about uh, the hashtag own voices and, and sort of riffing off that a little bit. Um, I actually have, like, within the months of March to June, I had several Twitter conversations and several Twitter threads and participated in several Twitter <laughs> hashtag conversations. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure which one you're referring to, but the one that strikes um, that um, I, I kind of went on for a really long time about was inspired by two different conversations happening um, at the same time. What, and this was in early April, in which, in which I kind of like talk about people who ask, you know, for advice on how do we write minority characters well, and how do we, you know, do this respectfully and authentically, and they always mean so well when they ask about how to do it authentically, and I'm like, I don't even understand what this question of authenticity is anymore, because like people look at me and they don't think I'm authentically Chinese, um, because diaspora is a thing, and like, you're asking to get to the essence of an ethnicity, and it's like, but there's no such thing. And so it was a very, very frustrating kind of conversation to have. Um, but there was also another Twitter storm about yet another novel, I, I think it's a novel, um, that was authored by a white person, and it was um, about Asian characters. And it was also another like badly done um, novel. And so there's this, there's this firestorm criticizing this, and a lot of my fellow Asians were just like, why is this a thing, and why do we have to keep doing this, and won't anyone like pay attention to us? And, um, and so I was thinking about that in relation to like, white authors asking for advice on how to do this well, um, and especially since I'd just gone to a, a convention where I was on a panel about writing the other and I was asked about how do I write indigenous, how do I write Native American characters? And I was like, well, have you gotten in touch with, um, you know, the tribe that you are writing about? And she's like, yeah, I have. It's like, I've researched it, and I know how to contact them, but have you contacted them? It's like, not yet, <laughs> but I will. And I'm like, well, great, you've, you've done some of that really important work. Go, go do that thing. Go contact them, write them, you know, ask, just say to them, like, um, I'm writing this novel. I would like your advice. I don't want to like be offensive. Mm, please, um, is there anyone who's an enrolled member of your tribe to like help me out here somehow? And I don't know what it was. And I tried so hard to be so positive to her, and she looked so miserable. And my answer, and I was just like, oh, what, what, what did you want me to say? <laughs> I don't know. So, so that was just my whole thing about like I, it just. I just wanted to understand, and I was just so, so I was using this Twitter thread to kind of think through it. It's like maybe there's just this there's this inherent problem in writing about the other that just distresses people who want to get things done right, and especially since writers already have like a bunch of anxiety issues, right? That's why we're writers. I don't know, um, but there is no sense that that as as people of color, we are the intended audience. And this is what makes these writers anxious because we are not their intended audience and yet we will be part, we will be folded into that audience and that makes them nervous because they don't want to be criticized for accidentally stepping on toes. Um, and that's how we get like this, this cornucopia of messy, good intentions, bad execution or anxiety over bad execution which leads to some, you know, like, tunnel vision of how the project is going to go. So, yeah. So that was that. And then it was, like, whitewashed out, which was yet another, I think it was Ghost in the Shell, yeah. the, like, <laughs> featuring <laughs> Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> um, and so, like, that started another whole thing, and I was like, well, you know, you could just 
read more Asian media. I don't know. Um, and it was also the time of um, Brazilian, like my publisher's um, uh, Indiegogo campaign to kind of like take like scale up operations. So yeah, so it brought on a whole bunch of feels about production and industry and the culture industry and who gets to participate and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, um, you know, the intended audience. And I feel like that's, you know, another big part of the conversation is that you, if you're a writer who is white and you're writing a protagonist or, or other important characters that are characters of color, is the audience meant to be only the mainstream audience, which is mainly made up of white readers or assumed to be mainly made up of white readers? Or is that audience, you know, intended to be actually the people who are from that culture or who have, like, you know, some sort of connection to the identity of the character? And does it, I know it matters, but, like, how, how is it supposed to matter to the white author? So my first thing is, if you think your audience is nothing but white people, then you have no business writing a character of color, because that tells me you don't know any people of color. Mm -hmm. And so you're already in the wrong park. Um, and I think that's a big problem, is that a lot of folks who, who go out and write these, these books, they don't know any black people, they don't know any Asian people, and they're just like, I'm just going to borrow this character because I've heard diversity is a thing right now, and I heard it's going to give me you know, a better chance to get published. So um, my first thing is, is you have to keep in mind who your audience is. Um, if I hear one more person say, well, I wrote about elves and I don't know any elves, I'm going to punch them in the mouth because you know, elves don't exist. Black people do. And an elf is not going to show up and say, you miss, you know, that's not how we live in our trees at all. You know, our cookies are much more delicious. What they're going to say is nothing because they don't exist. Whereas a black person is going to come in or a native person is going to come in and say, you kind of really messed up my culture. Um, and then a lot of times that criticism, especially in the kidlet side, I mean, like science, the adults SFF scene is a lot less about kindness. But on the kidlet side, a lot of times what happens is when you give that criticism, when you say, hey, this is my culture, and you really butchered it, and that sucks, the response is, why are you being so mean? You know, and whereas, you know, being stereotyped into one of three buckets is pretty freaking mean, right? Like, people get shot in the streets because of those stereotypes. So, like, I really think the problem is, is if you are a white author and you're expecting your entire audience to be white, you're already starting from the wrong place. Like, it's like starting with a bad idea. Like, if you start with an idea that, you know, for example, slavery didn't end in the Civil War and it continued through until, you know, the modern day and now we're dealing with the ramifications for it, like, you don't, you don't need to do that. Like, that shows me that you're not looking at the, the structures we have in place now, that you don't actually know what, you know, racialized um, politics looks like in current day because a lot of that stuff you know, hasn't changed in 50 years. You know, if you don't understand what, how redlining impacts the black community, why are you writing about how slavery would impact this if it continued 20, 200 years? You've already, you already haven't done the work. And I think that's a, that's a big part of it. It's like, I think people see it's a shortcut, right? It's a shortcut to give my, my character some, some sort of identity. Because, you know, it's like we've had, you know, 200 characters who are like the farm boy who's going to go out and rescue the world. So it's like, well, maybe if I make them a Latino farm boy, that'll give my character some identity. But if you're not going to do the work behind that and you're not going to see how that impacts your character within the story, then you're going to get called out, and rightfully so. I also don't understand why people are more sensitive about getting called about race depictions than they are sloppy prose, shitty exposition, like whatever other things that they have wrongs in their books. So that tells me that you're not ready to write that as well because you don't understand you know that racial dynamic and you're so sensitive about your racial your spot in the racial hierarchy that you don't want anybody to point it out you know if you're gonna get you know if basically if you're gonna get upset about people criticizing your books you really shouldn't be writing books anyway because somebody's always gonna hate your book for some reason now whether that, that criticism is valid like you have you know butchered a culture and, and you know piecemealed it out for your own plot building or what that criticism is just about, you know, is about your prose. But I, as a writer, would think my criticism about my di my flat, stilted dialogue is just as bad as my criticism about my flat, you know, incredibly stupid character. And I think that's that's really my problem is is the people who don't want to put in the work. You should be willing to put in the work, whether your character is white, whether your character is brown. You should be willing to put in the work. Agreed. <clears throat> Jamie, did you have anything to add? Um. 
I did, and I kind of want to think through the framing of what an intended audience is, because you know, like you know, you're you're bringing up the points like, is it a mainstream audience or is it you know the people that once protagonists is supposed to represent and by and large I think what a lot of writers are hoping is that their, their books go out to as wide an audience as possible which means the mainstream audience i.e. a lot of white people or the generic white person <laughs> out there in the great <laughs> white yonder um, and and why is and like I don't think we, we stop to think about why this mainstream audience is white i.e. white supremacy. Um, we don't stop to think about why we consider this mainstream audience to be this this generalized audience and why we want to write to them. Like why do you want to reach the widest audience possible and why do you write, want to write for that widest, whitest audience possible? <laughs> because that's essentially going to mean that, that, that to me is kind of a meaningless parameter for targeting your book. Um, because like, because even if we were to look at, at whiteness as a part of the mainstream, like that's still an identity. That's still actually really particular. Um, and, I'm, and I think it's really incredibly lazy to not consider whiteness as a very specific, very particular experience. But that's where we want to follow the money because people at the top has, have decided that the mainstream audience is this one very universal experience that everyone should be able to, um, to speak to. Um, and, that's, um, and that's just like, and that's really frustrating because it means that because the mainstream audience, I don't, that, that's such a meaningless word for me right now, um, is, is so like, it appears so omnipresent in how we, how writers want to direct writing towards that it fails to shape the, the writing into something that is more specific and therefore more meaningful and therefore more um, targeted towards addressing very particular issues and dynamics of representation and marginalization. Um, because we want something that everybody can read themselves onto. And we forget that we don't always do that. Like, I'm not going to read an American novel and think, oh, wow, that totally represents my experience. Like, <laughs> that's just, I grew up in a suburb in Malaysia. Like, the suburbs <laughs> of America are nothing like the suburbs of Malaysia, except for this very vague, like, we have to drive cars everywhere. But still, like, our shops we go to are totally different. Our McDonald's sell different things. And yet, and yet, I am supposed to understand. I'm supposed to um, identify with this very white character, very American character, for no reason other than they're the protagonist. Which you know what? I have an imagination. I totally can. So, but somehow this does not work in the, the other way towards a minority protagonist. Or we want. To, we want to read specific things onto the minority protagonist that just does not exist for this particular protagonist versus another protagonist who might fit into those stereotypes. And it becomes really frustrating because like, in trying to deliver these critiques of this is not reflective of my experience, there's this fallback of, well, you know, like, like at least there's some representation out there and some representation is better than nothing at all. It's like, yeah, but except it's not us representing ourselves, it's it's other people representing us. And that is a problem because I do not I I don't know if I can trust that this person represents me. And it is one thing for me to have a conversation with another Asian about the Asian experience versus a white person about the Asian experience. Or even like a black person about the Asian experience, or a Latina person about the Asian experience. Like, our understandings of, of these experiences and of these identities are going to be very different depending on the community we come from. And the, the resistance to these kinds of conversations 
is so frustrating because we always come up against this stupid, stupid wall of, oh, what can we do? Oh, what, what are we, what are we as writers supposed to do? Oh, like, how can we have conversations about it? Like, just go to, like, just, just read, just read writers by, you know, minorities, or just, just read literatures from other countries. Like, you, it's, it's not really that hard. I don't but know. I think, but I think a lot of times when people say that, they don't really want to know what they can do, right? Because that's work. Mm -hmm. They want you to give them the pass, like, high five, yeah. I give you permission to write me, which is me not really how it works. Give like, me a POC stamp of approval. <laughs> right. <laughs> POC approved. You know, and then they can point to that and say, like, hey, look. Um, like, and I think it's, it's – like, I, I know we're, we're talking about white people writing people of color, but it happens also sometimes, you know, with people writing cross-culturally, right? Yes. So, like, we just had a book in the YA community that came out by a Latino woman, and it's, you know, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's, it's she's butchered AAVE and made it into some unrecognizable semi-invented slang, but, like, mm -hmm. AAVE is not a semi-invented slang. That is a very structured language that people yes. speak between each other. And, you know, she did this, and, you know, the people, of course, all of her publication team was white. All the reviewers who gave it stars were white. So nobody came in to say, like, whoa, hold up, like, but then they have one black author who, you know, gave it the, you know, gave the stamp of approval. So now it's like, well, we can't, nobody else can comment because that, that POC gave their stamp of approval. Like, mm -hmm. no, but that's not how it works, right? Like, yeah. you can have the one person who's going to be like, look, I got to get paid. Here's my stamp of approval. Roll out with that, and the rest of us are still going to come up, come for you, right? We're still going to yeah. point to your your depiction and say like, this is offensive, you know. And I don't yeah. think I think that's more my 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 problem when white people come to me and like, how do I do this? Because it's like, are you asking me targeted questions? Are you asking me like, hey, like my black character is in this situation? How would they react? This is how I have them reacting. Is that realistic? Is it not? Is it not a strong enough reaction? Because a lot of times when I read manuscripts for folks, what I find is there's even on the page a lot of work to excuse white feelings of discomfort about race. So, for example, they'll put their main character in, like, some sort of situation where, like, they get called out by a shop girl or, you know, these very, like, stereotypical situations we know for black people, right? Like, you can't go to, you can't go to the store without somebody following you around. And then, like... You know, you're like, okay, this is okay, this is fine, and then you get to the end of the situation, and it's like, ha, the girl just really thought the girl was following her, but that's not really what was happening, you know. Ah, oh, racism isn't really as bad as black people think it. So, like, there's, like, all these feelings, like, or, like, there's, like, this whole big, big apology where, like, the person of color is like, that hurt my feelings. The, the white person is like, I'm sorry it hurt your feelings. And the person of color is like, that's okay, and we hold hands and walk off into the sunset set out of the scene. But I'm like, that's not realistic, like, you're even within the page, you're trying to excuse your feelings of discomfort about race. And mm -hmm. I think that's part of my, my, my biggest like heartburn when people are like, how do I do this? Because they're not really asking how to do this well. They're asking, how do I do this with a minimum of, dis of discomfort to me? And like, <laughs> it's not about you, right? Like, it's about a tradition of 400 years of oppression or more, depending where you come from. And so like, that's my biggest thing with that question. Like, how do I do this well? It's like, you put in the work. Just like everybody yeah. else does, you put in the work. And that's so interesting, considering, like, I, I think one of the major things about about books that people want to make criticisms of is, like, how do I make this plot more gripping? How do I put yeah. more tension into the story? It's like, you just had a perfect amount of tension that's also really super realistic there, and you decided to de-escalate it by making your white reader feel comfortable. Why would you do that? Like, is, is this real life tension too? Is it, is it too much for you? Like, what, what is wrong with there are certain kinds of tensions which we are okay with versus other kinds of tensions which confront the reader too much or we think confront the reader too much. And we become cowards in the face of that and we back away from that. And it's like, don't do that. Like, why, just be braver about it. And but I think it, it goes back to that 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 question you're talking about about mainstream audience because mm -hmm. it goes back to that idea that well my white a white person's reading this I don't want them to be just uncomfortable but what about the black reader who's reading that who's like yo no that's not <laughs> that's not realistic yeah. at all you know what about yeah. the other folks who are reading it from other you know cultures who are like not represented at all so if you're still writing in the idea of your in your mind's eye with a white reader in mind you're going to make those mistakes. You're going to flinch at those critical points. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, 
I thinking about this in just in terms of the th the stuff that I do. You know, I teach right in the other classes um, with Nisi Shaw, and I you know would definitely say that you know all maybe you know I secretly some are not uh, sincere about it, but you know I do feel like all the students who have come through and and taken our classes with us are very. Um, sincere in their desire to actually do the work to to learn how to make this happen that's why they pay to take the classes because they don't want to just sort of blindly roll off into the distance creating characters that are you know turn out to be offensive stereotypes and so that impetus is is very good because that means that they're learning a skill they're becoming better writers um, but then there's also the other side of it which is like if white writers are you know creating these POC characters depending on like you know what I, different identity they're coming from, and because they're white, they have that advantage of maybe getting seen by an editor, um, whereas a, a writer of color may not be seen by the editor, or seen by the agent, or whatnot. Are they are they taking space away from writers of color by having their you know protagonists you know be from different identities other than their own? And you know, some maybe they're doing it, you know, simply to to ride a trend. But maybe they're doing it because they they really want to have that representation there. How do you, you know, address the the balance that comes with that? I think I one of the things I always ask folks when they say, "Hey, I wrote this story with a black main character," um, because it's usually a black main character. Every once in a while, it'll be you know a Latino or a Latina main character or or an Asian main character, which is really crazy because I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, why are you asking me? I'm not the person for that. Um, one of the things I always like to ask him is, like, why do you have to write it from this perspective? Like, can you tell this story? Can you make this analysis just as well, writing it with a white main character? Like, you can make conver you can have a conversation about what it means, what, what race in America, writing from a white perspective. You don't necessarily need to, to you know, co-opt, you know, a black narrative to do that. Um, I think the reality is yes, you are taking a spot away from an author of color if you are writing because there are still very much quota systems built into publishing. You know, we have our black romance for this season. We have our black space opera for this season. If you even get the one, right? Like sometimes it's like you got we got N.K. Jemison. We don't need anybody else this season. So like, I mean, like I think there's still like that that Highlander attitude about. Um, about representation, you know, there can be only one. There can be only one Asian author. There can be only one, you know, black author. Um, and so I think do think you are taking a spot. But more importantly, why are you telling the story from this perspective? I think that's really what folks need to when they're going to set up. Then they're sitting down to write, and they're like, my main character is going to be black because I I can tell the story better as a black main character. It's like, okay, but could you tell the same story with the same impact with a white main character? And will you tell it better? Because what I find nine times out of ten is they're tell they want a black main character for some contrived reason that doesn't make doesn't feel organic to the story and it shows on the page. You know, if you have a secondary character that is a character of color, you should still probably take a white writing the other class, right? Because you still want to make sure you have fully fleshed out strong secondary characters. But if your main character is a as a is a marginalized voice and you feel the need to tell that story, you need to question why. Because nine times out of ten it is some sort of like weird white savior narrative where they think they can save representation within the the um, category and they're going to be the ones who's going to fix the world and it's like yo you know black people are reading stories just because they aren't getting there they're writing them you know everyone is writing these stories you know it's like our the CCBC stats which is um um, the Children's Cooperative Book Council, I probably butchered that acronym, um, just came out with their stats for last year, and there were more stories about Asian main characters in Kidlet than there were by Asians. So those Asian stories, those Asian main mm -hmm. characters were mostly written by white people, right? Asian folks who had written stories had written stories with white main characters. What does that say about the industry when you have Asian um, authors who are afraid to write their own story? who are afraid to get it wrong, but then we have white folks who will just jump in and, and actually tell a story for them. That's that's the, that's an issue. And I yeah, I do think if you are a, an author who is like, I need to write this character of, you know, this main car character of color, like you need to seriously interrogate why, why you have to tell the story from that point of view. Because I, I'm willing to bet you don't, like you can just as easily tell your story from another perspective. 
I think this kind of goes back to as well. Um, just the you, you, um, you're talking about the industry at large, and I have yet to have someone come up to me saying, you know, I, do you think I'm taking up space? Because I think at some <laughs> level, people are going to realize that my answer is going to be yes. Yeah. Actually, you are. Um, and I mean, like, I don't know if this is your fault because you are writing a character of color and, you know, you really should write characters of color once in a while. Um, and you're totally taking space. And this is, this is generally an editorial decision. This is a publishing de decision. It may not ultimately be your decision of, of whether or not. All you can do is just, you know, make sure that your craft is done well. Um, but I think one of the things that kind of annoys me about that question is, like, why are you asking that of people of color? Why are you asking this question of people of color and, and you're worried about this? If, you are t if you're worried about taking up space, then is there a way for you to not take up that space? I remember I had this really interesting Tumblr ask once about this guy who was all like, oh, I've worked on this, this, you know, I've done this research for like 10 years and I really want to like write this story um, that's set in New Zealand about, about some Pacific Islander tribe and I don't want to like just give this up because I'm in, I've invested so much of my time in it. Um, but but I don't want to be appropriative and I don't want to like you know take a voice away. And I'm like, so what do I do? And I'm like, well, step one, write the book because clearly it's in your system and you need to get it out. Step two, either you give it to you know that tribe that you are writing about and have them decide what to do with it. Or two, you put it in a drawer and you don't let it see light of day. It's out of your system, it has been written, and your effort has not gone to waste, and you can just just leave it in a drawer. And then maybe one day you'll be dead and we will like, you know, recover it <laughs> and it you will get posthumous fame for this and not immediately profit off of it. But get it out of your system because clearly this is super important to you. Um, but and but you know like what what do you what does this say like I think what, that's my that, that would be my immediate question like what is it that you want me to say no you're not taking up space yes do write more of us like you know what the stats are <laughs> presumably you don't need to ask us for permission like we're we're not we're also fellow writers we don't have that power like we don't have that industry strength to say no like. You know, we've had enough token white writers in our roster writing people of color right now. Like, that's never going to happen, not at this stage. I mean, that totally happened for my anthology, but, you know, like, that's not going to happen. Um, because, like, by and large, the, the, the industry is so white supremacist that, like, we are not the ones that you should be having this conversation with. Take up that conversation with your editor. Take it up with your publisher. You know, like, like there is this, um, this, this, this thing where I feel like, you know, speaking back to your your point about, you know, does this story have to be, from the perspective of a person of color? Can you also tell the story from uh, the perspective of a white protagonist? And uh, and I'm like, okay, if, if the notes you want to hit are questions about race and the dynamics of racism and how it affects, you know, the world that your character is in. You can also do that from a white person's perspective. Mm -hmm. And maybe you should do that. Maybe you should write a really, really white, fragile, a, a white character who is very, very fragile and have them angst through it for 200 pages and see what happens. Because that might be interesting. Um, because white people also live in a world where racism ex is experienced by many people. White people also experience racism, but not as in it affecting them the same way it affects people of color. But white people are also witness to it. They are also, you know, they, they, they also see it happening and just choose not to talk about it because of white fragility. And I feel like that is a conversation that white editors, white publishers, and white writers need to be having with themselves about that to get your feels out about it mm -hmm. because processing it through people of color is like 
We become your conduit for your white fields, and I don't know. I want to write my novel, damn it. <laughs> I just want to do my thing. So that's how I feel about that, that question about taking up space. Like, are you willing to step aside if you're worried about this? If you're really, really worried about it, are you willing to step aside? Or are you willing to, like, somehow leverage your position and bring, you know, writers of color to center? If you're not, if that's not somehow not your first solution, then I think you need to ask about why you're asking that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I read uh, Cameron Harley's Geek Feminist Revolution, I'd read some of the essays previously on her blog, but I hadn't read all of them. And, and Tor actually asked me to read the book uh, to blurb it, and I did. And one of the things that I said about the book is like I felt like it was next step in the conversation about writing the other because of the fact that she addresses like what you just said where it's not just about okay I put some people of color in my work um, I've, I've decided to write the the person of color protagonist um, though I'm white etc but then you know you also interrogating what else do I have to do as a writer other than just that in this world that we're in right now how, you know how do I bring other people's voices to the forefront? How do I acknowledge what's going on with me, the privilege that I have, the position that I have in, you know, in the community, in, you know, mainstream culture, whatever it is, and then, you know, not just sort of sit back and go, well, look, I've, I've examined it. It's great, isn't it? Or it's terrible, but actually like doing active work to bring it forward, which is one of the things I appreciate about that book. Oh, that sounds awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. No, it is, it's, it was that was one of the things that that I that surprised me the most about the book. Not that mm -hmm. I was unaware of what Cameron did, but just I was unaware of how often that she she nails that down, like in mm -hmm. different essays about different things, um, which I, I very much appreciate. Which is why I love the book. Um, it, but also thinking about. When I read the first series of tweets about this from you, Justina, you, you gave this really great metaphor that I've continued to use because... The creme know, brulee the, one? The creme ah! brulee metaphor, yes. It's, it's great. a great metaphor. <laughs> and I was, I'm going to try to like not butcher it, but basically mm -hmm. what you were saying was like, you know, if you, if you have creme brulee and the first creme brulee you ever have is from like, you know, the grocery store down the street, mm -hmm. you're like, hmm, this is really good. I love creme brulee. Creme brulee is awesome. And then you go to France. And you like go to some fancy restaurant, some fancy pastry, you know, place, and you have creme brulee that's made by a master French chef who has like spent years training to in order to make like the perfect creme brulee. And you eat that, you're like, I've I've tasted heaven, and it's the most wonderful <laughs> thing, and, and you fall over yourself. And then you can't like go back home and eat creme brulee from this you know the corner store anymore because like oh you know that's nice. It's a lovely pudding, but this is not creme brulee. Like you have to, I, I need that thing that was made by the master chef. And so it's you know it's a different experience. But like once you've had the better thing, then you don't want to go back to the crap thing. And so if you are you know a writer who's trying to write characters of color, say you're a white writer trying to write a black person, you know you're probably producing the equivalent of the corner store creme brulee, whereas a person who is black can produce the French chef ultimate version of the creme brulee for their experience. Which one of those do you want to have? Obviously you want to have like the French chef one. But if you are a right writer and you want to get to the you know fancy French chef version of creating a protagonist of color, like what are what do you feel like are maybe the steps towards doing that? Like obviously you know reading the book, writing the other, taking one of the classes and whatnot. <laughs> but like what are the what are the other things that, that white writers can do if they're like, okay, like I understand what you're saying. What what should I do then to like to get my creme brulee to French chef trained at the Sorbonne levels? So one of the things I find a lot with um, especially white folks trying to write um, outside of their their cultural experiences, they don't read outside their cultural experience. Like I can't tell you how many times I've spoken with you know, like white authors who are like, "Oh, I want to write this fantasy with this, you know, this this African-based fantasy, and it's going to be amazing." And I'm like, "Oh, have you read N.K. Jemison? Have you read, you know, Nettie? Have you read like all these folks?" And they're like, 
oh no, I've never, never, never read them. You know, I'm like, oh, I read that. You know, I read Kindred once. You know, like just what reading one Octavia Butler book does not make you prepare you to write like black main characters in sci-fi. Um, and so I think that's part of the work. It's like if you want to study with a master. Like, you have to study a master. You have to read the pages. You have to try to extract some of that nuance that you're going to see on the pages. Because that's one of the things about identity, is it's very nuanced. Like, if you're reading, you know, um, James Baldwin, right? Like, and then you read, like, ta Coates, you see those echoes and nuance within the writing. Like, you see how they, like, how the black experience in America, even over 50 years, has changed, but not really. So I think that's one of the things, um, you know, authors really need to do first and foremost is, you know, understand that the black experience is not what your five-minute soundbite on the evening news. Um, I see that a lot also. Is like, you have to understand, like, you know, Although black suffering sells books, it's not all suffering. Like, there's a lot of joy in being a black person. Um, there's a lot of, you know, like inside jokes and like, you know, like you know, the fact that when you go somewhere and you see another black person and you're like, hey, like, hey, and like you greet each other. Um, and like my husband's white and he's always like, did you know that? Do you know them? I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> We're just like <laughs> letting each other know, like, hey, I see you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like that's the stuff that people don't get. Like they don't get the the joy in that identity. All they see is the suffering. So if your book is nothing but suffering, you've already missed the black identity. You've already completely like missed it. Like you miss that there's like burnt sugar on top of the creme brulee. So like that's one of the things I really think is like the nuance. You're gonna get it from reading other people, and then you know you really need to go out and meet people. Like if you don't have any black friends, like you need to do some soul searching and figure out why. And I get some people are like, "Well, I live in a really white neighborhood." Look, I live in a really white neighborhood, and I'm a black person, so like, I, like I exist. I'm here. I'm like, so you know, like make those friends. And I think that's one of the big things is like you have to do the work. You have to do your research. Um, there, there are no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts in any kind of writing, whether it's you know building plot, building you know um, realistic characters, um, you know pacing or dialogue, there, there's just no shortcuts. You have to do the work. I kind of want to um, think through the creme brulee metaphor for a second here. And because I think in, like when it comes to writing by people of color, um, there might just be the phenomenon of what happens to Asian food, whereby it's great when it's done by white chefs. <laughs> but you go to a real Chinese restaurant, and there are different kinds of Chinese restaurants, right? That's the Chinese restaurant where you go and you get your general so chicken. I don't yeah. even know what general so chicken is. All I know is I don't like it. And, like, this is supposed to represent Chinese food. Um, and, and you expect it to be cheap. You expect it to be cheap. You expect it to be fast. You expect it to be good all at once. You would never expect that going into a French restaurant asking for really, really good creme brulee. And yet that's how I feel about um, about a lot of like Asian food and in a sense also like um, POC writing where we are expected to do a lot of this proper representation that caters to the white palate for really cheap. Um, so don't do that. Don't devalue our work um, for starters. Um, and I, I, I totally agree, like, you should be reading um, books by writers who, and I think the other thing is that you don't want to read writers who are simply writing about their experience, that, about, like, this generic immigrant experience or whatever, like, but also writers who are writing specifically for their community. And this is one of the things that I've really respected about a lot of the black science fiction writers is that they are clearly writing for a very, for a very specific community. And what is specific to that really translates into a wider audience. And it actually is much more joyous to read that kind of fiction than it is to read, you know, someone who's trying to represent the entirety of the black experience and and it just kind of falls flat because there is no way to do that without any nuance. There's so much richness to be had there. Um, so and and that comes from acknowledging that you know a community is made out of many many different kinds of experiences. Um, and that's why I kind of don't really enjoy a lot of books that are catered to this generic mainstream audience, right? Because it kind of wants to flatten all that nuance into something much more palatable. And um, find find books that are not palatable to to white people. I guess I don't know how you would find them. 
but you but okay so we, if you want to know if, a, if an Asian restaurant is really good I've discovered this is you look into the restaurant and if mm -hmm. there are lots of Asian people there and very few white people there that's a good place to go you should go that's to. the places I always try to eat at <laughs> exactly so I figure you know I figure like you know if if there's a book which is re read by a lot of like the minority population mm -hmm. that it is about you should maybe pick up that book and if, especially if it gets panned by white critics then maybe maybe it's got something that you don't know um, is, is good for you. Also, don't just watch Wuxia films and think that you can write about Asian um, <laughs> stories. Like, just there's a very particular context for Wuxia films that um, even I don't understand all of it because I'm diaspora. And there's a whole cultural context there. And it, and, but Wuxia films are appealing specifically because it comes from this context and it is geared towards that specific cultural context. And the fact that it's fun for everybody else does not diminish at all the importance of that context. That context is actually what makes it much more realized than anything else. Um, and yeah, I totally agree. Stop with the torture porn. Like, it's mm. just, that's not our lives. That it's just not our lives. Yeah. I think it's like, I think it's kind of worse for it for um, folks from an Asian background though from like black folks though so like I think there you guys see a lot more appropriation and piecemealing out of your cultural relevance and I think I don't know if it's if that's like the whole anime effect or what but like I feel like I've read more like flattened Asian fantasies than I've read like black fantasies like I think there's a lot of like anti-blackness within the world still that people like don't want to write like you know unless we're like the secondary character that dies for the cause like you don't really see a lot of like black main, main, uh, black main characters or any like black based fantasy but I feel like I read a lot of poorly done Asian fantasy where we're like we're gonna take this from Japanese culture we're gonna take this from Korean culture and we're gonna take this over here from Vietnamese culture and mush them up and look I have a brand new fantasy world so I think like back to your metaphor of like like the cheap, the cheap Chinese food that you get at the corner store. Like I think it, it it applies, right? Because you can get your sushi and you can get your like Szechuan and you can get like like those donuts, those little fried donuts that have nothing to do with Chinese food at all, all in the same place. And you're like, what the hell is this? Like so, and I, I make up your mind what kinds right. of food you like specialize. <laughs> or I mean, I actually don't mind going to a store where I can get like Japanese and Korean food in at the same time. Like you know, as long as the chef is doing it well. Yeah, but sometimes we're not, and it weirds me out when I I've gone into a Thai restaurant and it's like I can hear Cantonese coming out of the kitchen, and I'm like, I, I, what? Why is this a thing? Um, and it just has to do with like you know supply and demand, and and who what a, a neighborhood wants to consume a lot more. But to speak to your point about um about more flatly done Asian characters, um I think there is. Um, I think definitely that, that that the mainstreaming of anime has something to do with that, um, and it's in it's a kind of like monkey see monkey do, um, and nobody wants to do that with uh, a whole lot of blackness because Asians are kind of the other white meat, so we're mm -hmm. slightly less intimidating, I guess. I don't know. You're the good minority. Um, we're the good minority. <laughs> yes. um, we are the minority used to, to kind of like stay of blackness, right? Right. Um, and so we are infinitely more consumable than, um, than, than black media, I guess. I, I don't know. Um, and that's why we will consume all this K-pop and K-hip-hop, right? Because it's much more palatable. Because you've got, even if you're not getting a white face, you got a white skin face, and that's okay. Um, and and yeah, I think also too, there's just um, there's just a very very long tradition with Asian diaspora communities to piecemeal out. Um, our heritage and adapt it to whatever cultural context we enter. So um, this is not just about assimilating wholesale into um, into whiteness here in America. We still try to maintain some little bits and pieces here, and that is what goes through. And not only that, but we also try to pare it down to a, to a certain extent so that we become less threatening to whiteness. And part of how you make yourself less threatening to whiteness is that you make yourself consumable. 
And I feel like that is the case for many Asian communities um, here in the States and even across the world where, you know, we have to, I don't know, prop up our local economies through, 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 through a tourism industry that very often caters to an imperialist white colonial gaze um, that somehow still remains. And that means like offering ourselves up to be consumed by um, by this white gaze. And so that means like, you know, we can take pieces of this and that will be fine because we will reconstitute ourselves like Voltron. I don't know. <laughs> That's how I feel about that. <laughs> oh, oh no, I just that sounds horrible. <laughs> um, how are we going to get out of this? Uh, well, I will say uh, one of the things that I discussed when when those tweets first came up, there was actually a discussion in the the writing of the class I was teaching at the time about this and about like what what white writers can do um, other than just like the stuff that I was teaching, which was a lot of, you know, you, you have to read the books, you have to do the research, you have to do the things. But I also talk a lot about how I feel like in writing, we don't value practice or, or getting our feet wet with things as much as other artistic disciplines do. And one of the things that I ended up suggesting was saying, instead of starting out with a protagonist of color, or even like a viewpoint character of color, starting out by having a character or many characters of color who are in secondary roles, who are not necessarily like, they're not the background, like they're, they're there, they're active, they're doing things, they're crucial, but they may not be the main character, they may not be POV characters, like that's where you start. And then, you know, as you do that more, you get more writing skill down, you become more virtuoso, you can actually start to to make the actual creme brulee. What, how do you all feel about that advice? I actually think that's great advice. I think, I think if you want to write a main character of color, you need to start with writing fully fleshed out, awesome secondary characters of color. And like you said, not you know caricatures. Like, don't write me a magical Negro and a sexy Latina best friend and those kinds of things. Like, give them their own story arc. Like, give them their own shit going on, basically. And I think when you start from that point of view, because you know the, the the cliche is always like, well, I write main character, I write main characters of color. I just see them as people, and I'm like, right, but like you don't because your main character of color on the page is like eating fried chicken and sucking their teeth and talking about how much they can't wait to go get some that red drink. Like so, like if you're all your main characters are is doing a stereotypical things, you still aren't seeing them as a person. You're seeing them as a care a quote character. So I think that's a great idea to like write secondary characters who are have their own plots, have their own shit going on. So then when you come to like, hey, my main character might be white, but I have this great secondary cast that's like doing things, and hey, maybe my second book is them. I also think we undervalue the I think we greatly undervalue the idea of writing books that don't succeed. Like some of my my best learning has come from the books that failed. <laughs> like the books where like you get to the end, you're like that is a shit show and no and she'll never see the light of day. Like and I think that's like we need to like folks need to like let go of this idea that, oh my God, I have this idea for this book, the black main character. Okay, cool, write it. Because it might never ever see the light of day. You might write it and you might be like, no, like put it in the drawer. Like don't keep trying to make fetch work. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Like just put it away. And I think that's that's a great that's great you know advice is just write write the damn thing and then afterwards see where it is put it away, go write something else, just keep writing and keep moving forward. Yeah, I think the whole, like, you know, the practice of writing is that you need to keep writing, right? Like, if you stop, then you deprive yourself of some of a, of a learning experience that you will only be able to have, only if you keep writing. I kind of, I'm a bit mad on the idea of making um, um, secondary characters of color as like a stepping stone because like it kind of feels like, oh, well, you're just like playing practice with writing humans. And I mean like, the, but and I think like no matter what your secondary characters are, they're always going to be a protagonist of their own story that the, your, your viewpoint, main viewpoint character is not going to have access to. And that should just be like across the board, like, you know, just plain writing practice, um, even if it, it, no matter what, um, what kind of marginalizations they face. And 
and, it, and I'm kind of leery of the idea that you know you can do practice runs of mar of writing marginalization, um, because I feel like that could be abused, um, and I think and I think that just just goes back to Justina's first question really early on, like why are you doing this? Why are you writing this character? Um, interrogate your desire to write secondary characters of color, um, and why why you feel your protagonist will interact with these characters of color in such so in such and such a manner. Um, and I think the other thing too is like, you know, where I agree that we're really afraid of of being yelled at and of getting things wrong. Um, and I wonder if there's space for for writers to just let themselves get yelled at in a way that will be that they can process constructively, um, rather than oh I'm so sorry please teach me better senpai but but more like <laughs> wow there are, there are particular kinds of criticisms coming at me right now and this is probably my weak spot because it's gonna come whether or not your protagonist is whether or not your character of color is the protagonist or the secondary character. It's going to happen, and you need to be able to take this being yelled at and not be all like, oh, my God, that was so mean. It's like, well, maybe some of it is mean, but maybe that's okay, too. Like, because people are, are just different like that, you know. And sometimes we're mean, and there is space for meanness in our lives because people are human beings, and human beings are also super petty sometimes. And so what's wrong with that? Like, what do you mean you don't uh, you don't like people being mean to you? Like, people are mean to you all the time, just not specifically about issues of race. So you can survive all that other kind of meanness, but you can't survive this one. You can, I promise. <laughs> well, it's it's always different when it's your baby. But but speaking of that, um, I just see that I know that you uh, in particular have put together a list of sensitivity readers. Um, at writingthemargins.org, and you know you're encouraging people to not only you know to utilize the services of sensitivity readers, but for people who do that work to be like, you are going to pay me for this because this is, mm. this is a lot. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> a lot. get paid. If I gotta get yeah. angry at this. I better get paid. Right, you need to eat. <laughs> like, get paid. like anger takes up energy. I need food for that energy. Right, you gotta pay me. So, but then it, thinking about like how, what are the things that you have run into that you've seen where people are not utilizing the the sensitivity reader experience to the fullest, um, which I assume it involves a lot of whining. Yeah, so like the biggest thing I see with folks is they get the sensitivity reader to get that POC check of approval. Like I had a sensitivity reader. Um, the other thing I, I see is folks are like, I don't know which sensitivity reader to hire because like so so a lot of the 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 responses will come through me because um, for, for the sake of people not having their email addresses and their personal information out there, I'm like, look, just email the generic, the writing in the margins email address and I can forward it to the person. But I do get sometimes I get folks come in, they're like, okay, but I don't know who to send this to. And I'm like, well, tell me about your main character because that's kind of a red flag for me. Like, if you can't figure out who in the database to send it to, like, do you really know, like, you know, what part of Mexico your pro protagonist is from? You know, you, they're just generic illegal immigrant. Like, what do you like? Or like, uh, what is the, we don't use illegal immigrant anymore. Undocumented citizens. Now, so like, I mean, like, so like, like. What are you? What's the work that you did before you came to me? Like I, I feel mm. like a sensitivity reader should be the last step in the chain. Like after you've worked out all the process problems in your story, after all your best friend Becky has read through the manuscript and told you all the plot points that you forgot to hit, after your agent has come through and given you a round of notes, you know, like after you are like, I am almost ready to send this out on submission. Let me get one last pair of eyes on it. That's when the sensitivity reader should come. And again, you need to come to that with, you know, humility and a sense of wanting to do the work. And I think a lot of times people just, they want to make excuses for why they did the thing. Instead of just saying, okay, cool, I'm going to go fix this, they want to argue about it. And it's, it's not a conversation, right? It's, it's show me how to do this thing. I showed you how to do this thing. You either go do the thing 
or you say, cool, I'm not going to go do the thing, and you don't do the thing. Um, and I think that's been the biggest issue with sensitivity reads. Um, the, also, the idea, like, well, people will tell folks, like, this is not okay, this is kind of poor depiction, which this is what's happening a lot before we did a sensitivity reader database. One of the reasons I did the database is because a lot of people are complaining, especially authors of color, because diversity is such a big, like, trend, and I hate that word because it's not a trend, because I'm still going to be here, you know, I might not be pegging my jeans anymore, but I'm still here. Um, it's not a trend, you know, people exist. But it's kind of like this thing, everyone's like, oh, it's going to get me, it's going to be my golden ticket to getting published. You know, I'm going to write a not white character, main character. So one of the things we're seeing is like a lot of people are getting asked to read these manuscripts, but they weren't getting compensated. And then it takes a lot of time to read someone's manuscript to go through and say like, hey, these words are problematic. Hey, I don't know how you meant this, but this is how I read this. Okay, this would never happen, and it's really offensive. Like it takes a lot of it takes a lot of emotional um, currency to go through these mm -hmm. these manuscripts and like pick out these things. And so my thing is, if they're going to take up your emotional currency, take up your time, they need to be compensating you, especially if they're not going to follow what you tell them. Um, so that was one of the reasons we came up with the database, the sensitivity read database. So for could a try to get it right. By having somebody who you know lived that experience, like tell them where they where they missed the, the points that they missed it, where where the notes ring false, so to speak, and and two to give people like compensation for that work that they're already doing, um, because like I, I have a lot of friends who are like you do not understand how many how much how many emails I get like I get them I was getting them myself before I put prices on my website like I would get them like once a week I would get someone like hey I have a, I have a question to ask you about my black main character and I'm like okay do you understand like I have my own work to do like I can't do your work for you as well so that was really the impact the impact behind it like it's not supposed to be meant as like a stamp of approval for folks who want to write these stories it's not meant to be you know a shortcut to doing the work it's just supposed to be one more tool in your toolbox to get it right mm -hmm. and I'm and I hope people use it that way instead of just using it as like a, a shortcut Check the stamp of approval, 100% POC approved. So, yeah, I think the whole thing that people are getting uncompensated and ignored for that, for all that work that they put in, yeah. is one of those things that one of the reasons why I really enjoy the idea of a database with sensitivity readers for whom for who will get compensated. Because that has happened to so many friends of mine where they they will read a thing by this problematic white author and they'll be like, okay, this has this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem. This is basically unreadable to people of my heritage. And then nothing happens. The author just goes on and publishes it anyway mm -hmm. um, because they know that they can get away with it. Um, and they've already had that pass, they didn't like what the sensitivity reader had to say, and they don't have to really, in the long, in, in the larger picture, they don't really have to care. Um, and to me that would not be a thing that, that comes in as one of the last steps of manuscript finishing. That would come in in the early drafts to, say, to point out, okay, these are some really early mistakes that you should not be making in later drafts because this could lead to some hugely structural problem. Um, because to me, like um, issues of of cultural misunderstandings are structural issues because they are issues of character. They are not like typos at the end of a process for me. But I mean, I guess. But but different writers are going to have that different that process differently. I think that's great for every single stage of the writing, and not. But as an additional tool, and not like one for stamp of approval. Like you know, I just got my certification for this <laughs> process. I am now qualified to do this thing. Like no, you had a conversation about this thing. Yeah. The black person said, and that's what there was one black person. Yeah, <laughs> one black person to rule them all. <laughs> <laughs> so there, I, I will mention here that in the description of this video or in the materials accompanying it, whichever one it ends up being, um, there are links to the Sensitivity Reader Database as well as links to um, articles and blog posts that have been written uh, about this, uh, some of them by the people participating in this roundtable, um, that just sort of go deep into this 
this idea of like what you know the the setting out to write characters who are different from you, but like also the other things that are attended upon it. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask if either of you um, had anything else that you wanted to say about the topics that we've covered, anything that I didn't ask you that you were burning with a need that you wanted to get out there. Nah, man. Every day, all day, every day on Twitter, I'm there. <laughs> well, me too, but I will say, because I want to return to that, to that question of the why, um, because I think that's such an interesting question to ask every single author because they all have like very different reactions. Why this? And either they'll be like, uh, 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 and like, that's not compute. Or they'll have like a really interesting answer and that's really cool. Um, and I'm just like, I'm just very, always very fascinated by the question of the why because presumably we're writing these stories because we want to tell these stories from our imagination and these imaginations are shaped by our experiences and by our knowledge of the world. So, you know, like, if you fail to write the other in a way that's realistic, then it's a reflection of that smallness of imagination. And I think that's, like, something that, that authors really need to think about, like, how big or small is your imagination, um, that it cannot encompass this larger world um, with nuance, um, with bearing like the fullness of of your knowledge or even and the knowledge available to you at your fingertips now through the power of Google um, and through the power of like all these databases you know that you could just re request from your friends in university um, and I'm very like like ultimately you you are providing the product for the industry and you don't have to write for the market you 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 have to write for you know you're writing for people ultimately and you need to think about who those people are it's like it's like one one person's hurt feelings are they like worth like you know like if you hurt the person if you hurt one person who is marginalized and you add to that is that is that comparable to like all the good reviews you're going to get from people who are perfectly comfortable I don't know, like, I think people need to weigh, weigh that in their own souls. Deep down! <laughs> That's how I feel. I, I'm with you there. Well, Justina and Jamie, thank you so much for this conversation. This has been incredible, um, and I hope that you know, the folks who listen to this, the folks who are, you know, potentially taking the classes or who have taken the classes, uh, just get a lot of value out of this. But as I said, they are around on, on Twitter a lot and in Facebook, and I'm sure that they are willing to continue the conversation, although they probably are not willing to answer all the questions about your character unless you pay them. <laughs> Always pay your sensitivity readers. That is $50 right. an hour. That's right. That's the takeaway from this. All right. Thank you both so much. And, Thanks um, for having us. Thank you all for watching. <laughs>